Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on which time zone you're in. I am Borchin Nunel. I am the executive director at the Institute for Policy Integrity at New York University School of Law, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar. Today's conversation is a first in a series of energy equity research webinars organized by Policy Integrity with the generous support of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Our goal in these conversations is to bridge the gap between academic research and policymakers. With that goal in mind, each of these webinars will have academic researchers supported by the Sloan Foundation, as well as policy experts who work on these topics on a daily basis. We hope that these conversations inform policymakers with the latest cutting edge research and results result in better policies. At the same time, we hope that these conversations will help researchers with identifying open policy relevant questions and help them better understand how they, they can focus their research for a bigger policy impact. With this backdrop, we wanted to talk about a topic that is critical to a just energy transition today. How energy transition impacts um, indigenous tribes, as well as the energy transition, the opportunities energy transition creates for these uh, communities. So without further ado, I would like to turn the microphone to Al Huang, who will be moderating today's discussion. Al is the Environmental Justice Director at Policy Integrity and a lawyer. His work uses a model that focuses on providing legal and technical assistance when invited to grassroots groups in low income communities and communities of color facing disproportionate burdens. Al? Good morning or afternoon, depending where you are. I'm really excited that everyone has joined us because we have an incredible panel. And I'm going to do some quick introductions. And then um, afterwards, each panel, we have four different um, present presentation groups. Um, and after we do eat those presentations, we'll do a Q&A session afterwards. So I'm going to announce the, um, the speakers first. So our first panel is um, comprised of Dr. Andrew Curley who is an assistant professor at the University of Arizona School of Geography, Development and Environment. His research focuses on how indigenous communities understand coal, energy, land, water, infrastructure, and development in an era of energy transition and climate change. Um, he'll be joined by uh, Monica Ehrman, um, who is the Charles J. and Inez Wright Murray Distinguished Visiting Professor at Southern Methodist University Dedman School of Law, um, where she'll be joining as professor of law in fall 2023, congratulations. Um, her scholarly interests are in um, the areas of property, natural resources, energy, and environmental law and policy. She is the principal investigator of a multi-year team grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to study the impacts of clean energy transition on Native American communities, which I suspect is what she's gonna talk about today. Um, our second um, panel is um, made up of um, Dr. Bindu Hedekar, who is an associate professor at the University of Vermont's Rubenstein School for Environment and Natural Resources. Her work examines environmental controversies surrounding emerging contaminants, land use development, and technology politics, and its social, legal, ethical, and environmental justice implications. She is a recipient of an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation grant to examine the history of electrification and renewable transitions in Northwest Arctic Borough, which we'll hear about today. Our third panel has three presenters, um, Dr. Julia Haggerty, um, who is an associate professor of earth sciences at Montana State University, where she directs the Resources Communities Research Group, a highly collaborative lab that researches the socioeconomic impacts of resource development on local communities. She is a recipient also of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation grant to examine indigenous fiscal policy and community resilience issues for energy transitions with the Crow Nation of Montana. Um, the second presenter is Jory LaFrance, known as, and I apologize, I'm going to massacre this, but as the um, Lichi Machilish, fortunate with horses, and comes from the Apasaluk Crow Nation located in southeastern Montana. She holds a BA in Earth Sciences and Native American Studies from Dartmouth College and is now a doctoral student at the Department of Environmental Science at the University of Arizona. She is an agent of change in Environmental Justice Fellow, founder of the Ilya Tichik Indigenous Environmental Justice. Um, she's a sorry fellow at, at the um, Indigenous Environmental Justice at the Ilya Tichik, and she's also at the Aspen Institute for uh, Forum on Women and a Girl Soar Fellow. 
In addition, she's a University of Arizona Cal's Impact Leader Fellow, a Climus Environment and Society Fellow, a Carson Scholar, a National GEM Fellow, a Sloan Scholar, as well as an NSF, NRT, Indigenous Food, Energy, Water Security, and Sovereignty Fellow. And then finally, last but not least, I'm Jordan Paz, is on the, on the third panel and is a member of the Apasaluca um, Nation, the Crow Nation of Montana, and holds a bachelor's degree in journalism and Native American studies from the University of Montana. As an analyst at the financial data services firm Kestrel, Ms. Paz contributes to our understanding of the complicated intersection of municipal finance and issues impacting American Indians. And then finally, um, we're very lucky to have um, Wahela Johns, who is a director of the US Department of Energy Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs. She is responsible for upholding and advancing the Office of Indian, Indian Energy's mission to maximize the development and deployment of energy solutions for the benefit of American Indians and Alaska Natives. Her background is in renewable energy, community organizing, groundwater protection, and environmental justice. And in 2019, she was awarded the Nathan Cummings Foundation Fellowship. These are our panelists and we're really excited that you've joined us. So we'll kind of get to it and we'll start by, I'm gonna hand it over to Andrea and Monica who are doing our first presentation. Al, thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen here and Andrew and I are going to uh, kind of step through this presentation together. And we just wanted to first give a huge shout out to the um, Institute for Policy Integrity and Birch and Al, Anna, thank you so much for all of your work and for bringing us together. And um, of course, for our project, none of this would be possible without the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. We're incredibly grateful and to um, Evan, Isabella, Jessica, huge thank you for making this possible. Uh, so our Sloan Foundation grant focuses on decision making and the ability for tribes who are in oil and gas producing communities who seek to transition to clean energy, what decision is necessary to better inform um, their kind of policy and uh, their decision making ability. Uh, to that extent, we have a Sloan Foundation grant, we have a multitude of phenomenal people and these institutions and to each of those people and partners, we're incredibly grateful. In particular, our grant focuses or our research focuses on two areas in particular. One is the kind of Southwest region. For those of you familiar with oil and gas, we're looking primarily at the San Juan Basin. And the, others, um, the other kind of potential area that we're also looking at is the Midwest and uh, the, the Bakken area. So we're looking at those. Our, our presentation today is going to focus on that south southwest region. We have um, kind of our, our goals and just being mindful of time and, and Andrew's going to hop in to talk more about uh, particularly our uh, community engagement portion, but we have these kind of four main pieces of our project. And I think one of the uh, one of the most important points to this presentation in terms of how to shape a research agenda and how to really function as a multidisciplinary team is that we needed these to sort of discrete components, but the purpose and the beauty of working with people with such a wide variety and diversity of experiences and passions is that we can sort of build and um, inform each other's work. So they're listed here as separate goals. We have this community engagement with our outstanding partners, the Southern Ute Indian tribes. We're also in the process of reaching out to other uh, tribe partners to really understand their priorities. So we don't speak for our partners. We don't speak for any tribe. What we hope our research will do is to magnitude or to give magnitude and amplify their voice and to direct to their voice or direct their voice to those who are able to, to hear them. And I think that really completes the analogy of not only having a seat at the table and a voice at the table, but to be heard and then to have your voice um, acted upon by decision makers. We're also correlating or taking that qualitative information and then we feed that into an economic model. And that's our outstanding team at Resources for the Future. We have Katie Hausman at Michigan. And then using that sort of economic policies that the, the tribe sort of tells us what kind of policies 
what kind of oil and gas scenarios they're looking at, we can kind of uh, model these different scenarios uh, correlated to different policies to show different streams of revenue of, pro of uh, production. With that in hand, we can also look to the sort of future of the just, just transition to use geospatial modeling tools to see, well, if we're going to transition to clean energy, what is the potential for clean energy on the um, tribe's lands? So we use GIS overlay to kind of look to see what is the potential for renewable energy. And then finally, we're looking at the legal and policy issues related to transition. So in terms of tribal sovereignty, in terms of relations between the tribe and the federal government, the tribe and the state, and then tribe uh, within the tribe itself, looking at tribal law. So we have these four pieces. And then what we're looking to do is really not just be a siloed component of teams, but looking to see how each piece informs and enhances the value within the other. And I know Andrew's gonna talk about this piece here. Thank you, Monica. And it's uh, really nice to be here in this um, forum and to be here with our co-presenters. Um, especially, I'm happy to be here with Wahela Chan, who, um, whose work has been very um, um, foundational to a lot of the questions that I personally have researched. And so it's, it's really, Kind of an honor to be in the same presentation space. Uh, she's one of our strong community leaders in on these questions. So uh, hopefully I don't mess up <laughs> the presentation. Um, with uh, with the work that we do. Oh, can you can we go back? Sorry. Uh, like like Monica said, we um we've been working in in uh, the Southwest up until this point with the with the Southern Ute. And uh, in my previous work has been the Navajo Nation. So it's a, an area that I'm somewhat familiar with, but totally different, right? Each one of the things that we want to emphasize is each in, indigenous, indigenous nation is unique, not just culturally, but politically, and in, in terms of where they're located in the geophysical conditions of their, of their um, reservation and their homelands, uh, which are, can be two different things and may play, play into energy decision questions. So, um, so these things are really important and that we try to um, situate every energy question within the unique um, context of that nation. And so we're, we're trying to be very respectful and grounded in our approach um, to, the, to the communities that we're working with. Okay, we can go to the next slide, thank you. And um, the, the community that we've been working with the most up until this point is a Southern Ute in Southern Colorado, one of the only two, one of two only uh, federally recognized tribes in the state. And, um, and their nation has been working with oil and gas for, for quite a while. And we've benefited a lot from their, from their experience and they've been generous. Uh, many people working in, in their institutions and sharing um, that history with us and, and getting us, giving us an idea of how you know their tribal governance has has evolved around these questions, and um, and so in order to do our work, in order to do the community engagement portion, to really get a sense of what tribal members, decision makers, activists on the ground are thinking, you know, we want to ensure that our methodology is respectful of tribal sovereignty and tribal self determination. So one of the key things that we do is we work through. Um, not only our university institutional review boards, um, and I'm sure other people are doing the same thing in their communities, but we also have to get clearance um, from the tribal nation itself. And we uh, do extensive dialoguing and um, presenting and, and pretty much um, try to put them in, in the driver's seat of a lot of the, the research uh, approach that we're taking because it, you know, the legacy of research in these communities has been one of extraction and exploitation. And uh, I, I made a pun up yesterday, we don't want to be extractionists on questions of extraction. So, you know, we really do want to prioritize tribal self-determination in our methodology, not just in, in um, the research uh, findings or anything along those lines, but in our approach from the beginning. We also want to respect the fact that there are multiple perspectives on these questions in a tribal community and not to silo 
the, those voices and not to have uh, and to simplify even in sometimes uh, race, racial or cultural stereotypes what the perspective of Indian nations are. I mean, we have complicated histories and philosophies on all of these questions, and we want to amplify those and not uh, and not um, you know make portray indigenous peoples as only victims in the in the narrative of energy development, but also people who are grappling with these questions themselves using their own thinking and philosophy on these issues. And so, you know, as a Diné person, as a member of the Navajo Nation, I can't also like speak on what you think or what other nations think. So like we're very aware of our the limitations of our of our knowledge. And so that's something that, you know, we're mindful of in our approach. So I'll hand it back over to Monica to, to go through the other slides. And you know, Andrew, um, too, I think that's really important. What you just said is that even within the community, there are still these different perspectives. So thinking about what the, you know, executive branch or what the agencies think might be very different from the community members and having Andrew's extensive um, qualitative engagement and his experience, it's, it's really been terrific. Uh, so this, this slide, the purpose of this beautiful NREL slide is the thinking about what are we transitioning to? So often when communities or when researchers think about transition, we need to think about what exactly is possible um, on the geographic location. And so that's our involvement or the building of this sort of GIS or the spatial overlay onto our sort of partners lands available and that might limit then the sources or types of uh, renewable energy potential. So there may not be access to geothermal, there may not be access to solar, you might not have the, the siting uh, space that's required for solar, but there may be potential for these kind of localized projects like wind. And with that, our you know law policy, our other teams also have to be very mindful about takeaway capacity. Um, do we have the infrastructure to get generation assets out to dis distribution. So thinking about those challenges too um, has been helpful um, uh, in, in sort of bringing together our different, different um, members' experiences. The other thing that we think is really important is the this concept of environmental justice. And if there's one kind of theme, I think that our, our team has really wanted to pass on to those of you who are doing research in the space, is to kind of move away from this really siloed notion of um, environmental justice, energy justice, you know, energy poverty. We tend to think as researchers and academics or often think of things very siloed. It's kind of a nature of our disciplines. And what we hope to do and what we are actively trying to do in our project is to really embrace a more systems approach. So this is an example of, of, of an or orphaned well and throughout Colorado, this is the map of, of orphaned wells. The orphaned well is a, a challenge in oil and gas um, uh, extractive kind of communities where there isn't a party who is responsible for the liability that's attached to these orphaned wells. And that can be, um, there could be uh, problems with seepage into groundwater, contamination of surface, subsurface space. Um, there might be emissions into atmosphere. And so trying to not only identify these orphaned wells, but trying to attach some kind of remediation to it is a, a huge problem in these kind of communities, in communities where there's been a history of extraction. So how do we then look to see how our work, how our project can inform tribal communities when they make these decisions with respect to how to address environmental injustices on their lands, especially though where they might have to work with the state or um, with the uh, federal government in, in addressing these. Andrew, did you wanna talk about, about this? Oh, no, you can continue. Um, I'll jump in later. Okay, yeah, I know you, ha you had a really good insight about this. We were talking about this earlier. And, and Andrew, you referenced it really beautifully, right? Is that the, uh, the importance of this work is we're not just looking at 
problems. We're looking at these amazing communities that have provided solutions and that are in fact leaders in the field. And Pilar Thomas, one of our um, members on this team, Daniel Ramey, who's phenomenal, they've been uh, really great proponents about that, is that there are all these beautiful lessons of leadership that other communities in this space can look to, for example. So this Red Cedar, which is a um, Southern U natural gas gathering company, you know, they've announced this carbon capture deal. So when we're thinking about transition, transition isn't only in the generation space, but transition also has to um, embrace um, sort of mitigation. So this idea of carbon capture, utilization, sequestration, not only as revenue sources, but as a methodology or a method rather to, um, to uh, generate revenue. This is, um, I'll just quickly go through. We have this amazing team, Daniel Ramey, our co-PI at Resources for the Future, our economics team, Brian Prest, who our model is based off of, our Alex um, Thompson, our GIS um, expert. We have this amazing Margaret Walls, who does our environmental justice component, Katie Hazen at Michigan, another amazing economist, Pilar Thomas, who is our phenomenal um, law and policy member, Monty Mills, director of the Native American Center and former legal director for the Southern Ute, and our newest member, um, Dr. Angela Parker at the University of Denver. Another big part of our team is also the um, mentorship of research assistants. So we have this amazing group of young research assistants who we are trying to actively not only mentor in what we are having success at, but also in the challenges faced by a multidisciplinary team working with communities, and they can learn from, from sort of um, our process. Andrew? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, we're good. We're gonna, thank you. We're wrapping up yeah, here. This and is thank, it. You. <laughs> thank you so much, Monica, Andrew. Folks, just so you know, um, we're going to come back to the panels um, later. So this isn't the last you'll hear from them. Um, but we want to make sure we move on and keep this um, the time running um, so we can hit all our goals here. So our Very next, well, panel, thanks. no problem. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Bindu Panikar, and she's going to talk about um, electrification and renewable transitions um, in the Northwest Arctic Borough. Bindu. Um. I hope you can see my screen. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Al, for that introduction. And uh, it is uh, nice to share this panel with other Sloan Fellows. I am um, quite grateful to Sloan to be able to work on this project uh, titled Energy Electrification and Renewable Transitions in the Northwest Arctic Borough. Uh, we just recently got the funding last fall, so we are just getting started on this project. Uh, we have had some setbacks uh, um, uh, because there, there have been some change in uh, uh, the co-PI uh, working on this project. Uh, so I also want to acknowledge uh, the partners, uh, Mads Almaselki, uh, who is at UVM and the key partner, uh, is uh, with the Alaska Center for Energy and Power, where I'm actually a visiting um, a fellow uh, this uh, year uh, while I'm on my sabbatical. The new co-PI of this project is uh, Michelle Wilbur. Uh, the former co-PI uh, is uh, Aaron Whitney, who's um, now the director of uh, Arctic Energy um, at the moment in uh Anchorage. Um, um, the other, um, um, uh, we've also gotten a small funding from the Gund Institute of Environment from University of Vermont. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and uh, before I start, you know, this uh, presentation is just a, a brief highlight of the things that we have done so far. Um, so um, probably, you know, um, you know, there's a long way to go uh, before, um, you know, we can kind of share the results from this project. Um, and to to begin with, I am uh, not a native Alaskan. I am on traditional homelands of El Kutna uh, Dunena land and doing research on the Inupiaq land with great caution 
and also uh, respectful of uh, the, the these cultures and land. Uh, and uh, um, I feel especially grateful to be able to learn uh, from this very uh, uh, rich community as well. So to begin with, um, I am going to be talking uh, briefly about our goals here, which is to uh, use uh, ethnographic methods and interpretive uh, uh, methods to understand uh, just transitions uh, in the Northwest Arctic borough. Uh, we are in particular, uh, particularly we are examining how energy transitions enhance community capabilities and address issues such as energy security, autonomy, sovereignty, sustainable community development, and climate and environmental resilience. Uh, we also, um, within this, we also want to compare how solar and wind transitions are um, um, especially enhancing transition efficiency, equity, and community capabilities. We also want to look into different utility ownership um, and also uh, decentralized models of uh, transitions in this particular region. So, you know, in terms of what we have done so far, I've uh, been uh, attending uh, the some of the uh, two of the energy steering committee meetings held in Kotzebue. These are two day events. Um, I have also in the last uh, energy steering committee meeting, which was held last week, I held, uh, you know, large group discussions on um, what energy sovereignty and energy efficiency means to the uh, group. Um, and this uh, steering committee, uh, you know, includes uh, members from all of the uh, 11 communities in um, the Northwest Arctic uh, borough. And uh, also, uh, you know, um, scholars as well as community members who, uh, who are uh, you know in the regions in the region also attended uh, the Alaska Village Electric uh, uh, Cooperative annual meeting which was also uh, just this month and uh, um, um, also uh, shadowed trips to troubleshoot renewable um, uh, infrastructure issues in a couple of communities I have uh, interviewed about uh, 25 people so far. We still haven't hired our doctoral student and a postdoc, which uh, we hope will be joining in the fall of 2023. Um, and uh, also uh, based on some of the qualitative data that we collect, we are also uh, hoping to do um, an optimization modeling and also to characterize uh, energy efficiency, which will be mostly done by um, Mats Aunsalki and also the uh, Alaska Center for Energy and Power. Uh, uh, most of uh, my colleagues there are um, mechanical and uh, electrical engineers. Um, and uh, I also want to kind of acknowledge uh, some of the partners that uh, we're working with, and I have gotten community consent from. I uh, first sought consent from uh, the Northwest Arctic Borough um, and uh, reached out to the energy manager for the Northwest Arctic Borough, who invited me to attend the energy steering committee meetings. Um, so far, I've worked with uh, some of these uh, groups, uh, City of Buckland Electric Utility, uh, uh, Ibnatchiak Electric Company in Deering, um, uh, the Alaska Village Electric Cooperative is the largest electric co cooperative in the state uh, and includes about um, over 50 communities. Uh, and many of the, uh, about eight of the communities in the Northwest Arctic Borough is part of the AVEC. Uh, and I got permission from the uh, the CEO, uh, Bill Stam, 
um, to uh, work in these communities as well. Also got uh, from um, consent from the Kotzebue Electric Association. Uh, have been working with uh, Deerstone Consulting to to do some um, um, uh, uh, sh uh, um, shadowing trip uh, to see uh, how people are uh, troubleshooting um, some of the renewable um, uh, electric uh, issues. And also uh, one of our partners is the Renewable Energy Alaska Project or REAP. So um, just a little bit about the Northwest Arctic Borough. There are about um, 11 communities uh, in the region and uh, uh, a population is about um, 7,800. Um, and uh, the key things that I really want to do to highlight are that um, many of these communities um, are uh, have um, high rates of poverty, except for uh, two um, or, or three. And um, uh, the 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 year that it has been electrified has been since the 1970s. Most of them got electrified as part of the Rural Elect Electrification Act passed by the President Roosevelt. And uh, so, so uh, this is just a basic um, overview of the communities. And none of these communities are on the road system. Um, and uh, um, and also, they are also not on the uh, uh, you know unified uh, grid system as well. I, I thought it would be um, uh, important to talk about why I am looking at the Northwest Arctic region as a whole, why this regional approach, um, largely because the Northwest Arctic uh, borough itself wants to, uh, you know, uh, look at transitions at that regional scale, and they are, uh, have been uh, early adopters of renewables, and they have, uh, you know, demonstrated examples of transitions over the past 20 years, um, saving over 50,000 gallons of oil. Um, um, also, most of the communities in the region have uh, work on microgrids, which are largely diesel uh, powered, um, and the diesel fuel is either barged in or flown to the region. Um, but still, there have been great interest in transitioning to renewables in the area. They have uh, developed infrastructure for wind, uh, have been the early adopter of uh, wind in the Arctic. One of the first community uh, to implement wind is Kotzebue in, in the Arctic as a whole. Uh, more uh, recently, they've been uh, uh, doing a lot of solar uh, in the region, uh, have also installed uh, heat pumps, biomass, um, creating interties between communities. Um, they still do not have a plan for bulk fuel purchase. Each community actually uh, uh, gets its own fuel, um, uh, which means every community have different uh, price uh, for fuel that they pay based on when they get it and uh, how um, and transportation expenses. Um, another cause for a reason for especially uh, switching to solar is the long sunlight hours in the summer with 30% reflection from snow cover in the spring, which uh, you know means that the, their peak production is actually between April and July. It's also good for green jobs and workforce development and training and capacity building. Um, also, um, a regional vision is, is good because it's much more economical, efficient, and uh, smaller project projects are more expensive. This is, this is also the borough perspective. And um, another reason is that it unifies uh, spread out communities to work much more cooperatively. 
and communities can learn from each other and elevate each other at the same time and uh you know uh, and not prioritize just one community or the other for renewable transitions but bring all community communities um uh, you know um on bring bring them up on the same level um and uh one of the interesting there's a, things there's a quick they, uh time time um no i think we're um been do like if you could wind down that'd be great great um and um uh, uh, so I'll end with this slide. Uh, one of the important things that uh, they are trying is this tribal ownership of renewable power in the region. Uh, and uh, um, and um, their goal uh, is to be 50% reliant on re uh, you know, regional, regionally available resources for electri electricity generation. And they um, uh, have... Um, you know, decreased uh, import diesel fuel by 10% um, um, already. And so you can see uh, that they uh, hope to decrease uh, imports of diesel fuel by 50% by 2050. That is the goal. And um, looks like they are well on their uh, track uh, to do this. And uh, reasons for transitions are here because of the increasing cost, um, um, you know, high rates of fuel poverty, and um, all communities buy fuel separately, which increases the cost. And it's also harder to barge in fuel in some of the communities. Some communities have to fly it in. And uh, also, there are not enough fuel storage tanks in some of the communities due to the growing demand and population. Thank you so much, um, Bindu. And I, I feel horrible um, kind of cutting this short, but uh, we want to make sure that we, all the presenters have a chance to present and then we have a, a robust Q&A. But um, thank you, Bindu. And um, folks have asked about slides. We're going to ask the presenters whether they can make those available and folks can see that. So we'll move to our next um, panel. It's um, Dr. Julia Haggerty, Jory LaFrance, and Jordan Paz. And I believe um, Dr. Haggerty is going to be the first presenter from this group. So I'm going to hand it over to her. Thanks so much. Um, I just want to echo my co-panelists' gratitude to the Sloan Foundation and to the Institute for Policy Integrity um, and my co-presenters. It's just an honor and so exciting to be in this conversation. And today, we're really pleased to share with you a little bit about the Absalica Energy Justice Project. This is a participatory community-based project addressing the impact of the energy transition for the Absalica, or you may know them as the Crow people. I would argue this is the nation's most at-risk tribe in the context of the decline of the coal economy. 60% of Montana's coal is mined in Bighorn County, where the Crow Reservation is located. The tribally owned mine has one customer scheduled to close in the next three years. The tribal government has lost about three quarters of its non-grant revenue in the last 10 years with the decline in coal production. Um, and that decline in revenue has major implications for critical services in a highly vulnerable population. So I'm just gonna say a couple of words about our approach and then I'll turn it over to my co-presenters Jordan Paz and Jory LaFrance, who participate in our project as fellows in what we call the Emerging Leaders Initiative. And as a side note, we have so little time. We have this very rickety um, shoestring website, and I do invite you to visit it because it has a lot more information about our project and our key partners, who include Little Bighorn College, uh, Plenty Doors Community Development Corporation, the University of Wyoming, and the Center for American Progress. So in developing over the course of nine months and weekly meetings, uh, this proposal with our community partners, um, what was really insisted on by our community partners was the question of capacity. Um, John Doyle, who's my co-PI pictured here, uh, overlooking the Bighorn River and, and uh, children swimming in it, which is possibly his most you know, important love is the river and its health. He just would ask every time we start a conversation about this proposal, what's actually gonna change for my people as a result of this work? Um, so our approach really attempts to answer that. 
Our research questions focused on a linked set of contemporary policy analysis and historical research. We're asking what's at risk with the loss of coal revenue? How will that exacerbate existing social vulnerability? Um, and then how does the institutional and governance history of coal and energy development explain why coal has failed um, to create a sustainable economy uh, for the Absalika people. And the central premise of our approach um, that comes out of this community-driven proposal is that future energy decisions have to be informed by a robust local knowledge about these issues. Um, this history isn't documented in any clear or accessible form. Um, and that energy justice for the Crow people will require major policy transitions that um, will occur outside and within tribal government. And those transitions are really going to depend on the leadership, knowledge, and advocacy of the Absalika people themselves. So for this reason, we've put a major portion of our budget into an emerging leaders initiative nominated by elders and advisory board following Absalika tradition. There's a cohort of 10 leaders who are engaged in a year-long pilot program to study public sector governance and the Crow Nation's energy development history. This takes place in regular meetings, in trainings, in the invitation that the leaders have to participate as paid research assistants on this project. So I wanna turn it over to two of these really inspiring Upsalika women, um, Ms. Jordan LaPaz and Jory LaFrance, and they'll talk about some themes that are emerging for them. Um, and then we have a closing slide about some lessons we're learning in our approach. So Jordan. Yeah, thank you so much, Julia. And thank you everyone for taking the time to be here. I'm very excited to be hearing about all of your projects and, and the, the wonderful work that everyone's doing throughout the North America. So um, yeah, like, like Julia had said and prefaced, uh, the coal dependence for our tribe is, is very large and is, is, you know, one of the things it's it's a bit of a, a Goliath that we're we're trying to to beat here and and overcome a little bit. And one of the challenges that we have identified within our conversations as fellows, but also you know just anecdotally um, through living on the reservation, and growing up there, is these conversations about an energy transition are not happening at a individual or localized level among community members. And this is a challenge because you know, the coal mine is one of our biggest sources of revenue and, and also sources of employment for a lot of our tribal members and residents. And it's really difficult as, you know, someone doing this work and working within, you know, energy transition and understanding the, the urgent need to transition away from coal. Um, it's difficult to have those conversations when you have relatives or family members who rely on that income to put food on the table for their families. And you understand the, the dynamics at play that, that keep you know, these conversations from being had. And one of those things that Julia had kind of referenced was the lack of knowledge around the policies in place and the history of decisions that, that put us where we are today around coal. And that's a, a common theme in many of our, our cohort fellow meetings um, that you know, we we don't we don't know how we got here. Nobody has told us how we got here. And, you know, it's even to the point where we don't even know where to take questions if we have them. Um, do we take them to our tribal leaders, our tribal governments? Do we take them to our relatives who might work at the coal mines? And, you know, that's just one of the the many challenges that we we actively discuss in in our cohort of how how can we spread this information? How can we bring these conversations and make them more accessible to our, our fellow, you know, Upsaluga people um, and help them understand the urgency of, of why we need to make this, this transition. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll pass on to Jory. Yes, thank you so much. I uh, also want to give a shout out to the Sloan Foundation. I'm also a Sloan scholar here at the University of Arizona, and I always appreciate the support. Um, and thank you for having me. And I, I mean, it's just been an honor to really be a part of the Leadership Institute that Julia and her entire team um, had brought to us uh, back on the reservation. I've already learned so much. And one of the things that we constantly talk about or that uh, is always brought up is how do we engage in 
this transition when we are in survival mode and survival mode can really come in many different forms and in this context I'm thinking about the cultural survival but also the day-to-day -day survival I think one of the things as academics um, we tend to separate ourselves from the real life that is happening every day on the ground and I, I'm guilty of this although I do try my best to bring myself back to the reality that we live in especially when it comes back to the reservation life uh, I was born and raised on the reservation I plan to go back to the reservation my entire family's there and so I think it's really important for us to understand and address the basic the the, the basics of the hierarchy of needs um these needs like the physiological like the basic things like good quality air to breathe, food, shelter, uh, having a roof over our head, getting a good night's rest, having clothes to wear on our backs, and then that safety of employment and health and uh, having a home to go back to. These are really critical when it comes to elevating ourselves in terms of, you know, feeling loved, feeling belong, um, having that self-esteem and that and the self-realization to be the best that we can be and the best that we long for. Uh, we're dealing with these historical and intergenerational traumas um, every single day. And that survival mode, it, it tends to hold us back from really having these conversations about just transition. How am I going to bring up a just transition to my relative who is trying to, who is living paycheck to paycheck, who is taking care of many different, many generations in one household. These are things, these are the realities that we live with, and these are the basic necessities that we have to address in order for us to have these difficult conversations, in order for us to, you know, create prosperity and these jobs and um, opportunities for us, we have to address these these basic needs. And I think, um, you know, the the lack of uh, access we do our reservation. Um, I ninety does run right through the middle of our reservation, and we're not that far from Billings, Montana, but. We are in a remote area. Our reservation is 2.3 million, million acres in size. It's bigger than Rhode Island. And we only have one grocery store in all of our reservation. So I these, these basic things, um, you know, access to basic things like reliable health care, grocery stores, a gas station, suitable housing. These are all things that have got have been brought up in our conversations that we need to think about. Um, and uh, I think Plenty Doors is doing a very good job of addressing those basic um, needs that we have um, in order for us to, to become better, to elevate ourselves, to, to um, have this just transition. And so I leave you with this, um, how can we do better by people who are in survival mode, it's really imp important for us to address the foundational needs in order for us to have a just transition for all. So I'd like to hand it over back to Julia. Okay, thanks so much. Um, and I'm sure that there would be an opportunity to interact with Jordan and Jory in the questions and answers. I just wanna briefly highlight that we do, we are learning some important lessons in doing this work. Um, those involve managing expectations of everybody, um, putting together a narrative history of coal development just for one nation in a participatory way. Um, it, the pace of expectations are set by Western <laughs> expectations of academic success and sometimes some like real optimism on our community partner side about what can be done. Um, archival work is really slow and deliberate. Uh, relationships we see as capacity um, and, and this project is really an experiment in putting the relationships first. It takes a tremendous amount of time and work um, to be present in community um, in it to create the kinds of relationships, not only in the research team, but as other panelists have mentioned within the community. Um, and there's a lot of fractured and difficult relationships and politics that um, are present in some of our conversations. Um, we think that ground up history like this is actually cutting edge. Um, there might be lots of theories that explain uh, why coal hasn't contributed a sustainable economy at Crow, but that story needs to be told from the bottom up. Um, and as Jory mentioned, we're really trying to direct as much um, of the resources from this project to some of those survival needs by trying to create employment, for example, at the local college, um, 
and trying to, when we have meetings, use local caterers. And we, we think about every decision in that way. Um, and then I'll just say that this is an incredibly difficult history and the meetings that we have between the advisory board um, and the cohort can be really painful for people. Um, and so there's lots that we can learn from a trauma-based or trauma-informed approach just to facilitating these conversations. So I'll close there um, and thank you all for the opportunity to share this project. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Haggerty, Joe Reed, and Jordan. Um, I love the ground up approach and um, I, th I think it's fantastic that that's been the centering part of your work. Um, we're down to our last speaker, which is um, Wahela Jones, um, John, sorry, excuse me, from the Department of Energy. And just to remind everyone, if you've probably seen the Q&A button on the bottom of your, of your Zoom, you can click on that and enter. Many of you have used it already. If you have a question you want to direct at an individual, you can do that, or if the whole panel you can do that as well. So I'm going to hand it over to Wahela. And um, here you go. Great, thank you. Let me figure out how to, again, sorry, trying to share my slides here. Uh, did that go? Yeah, it's up. All right, I did it. Um, well, good afternoon or morning, maybe for some of you. Um, my name is Wahela Johns. I'm the director of the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs at DOE. I'm originally from Northeastern Arizona in an area called um, Twin Jone, which is on Black Mesa and on the Navajo uh, Nation. And um, good to see Andrew and thank you all for having this uh, really great conversation around energy transition. Um, I actually, uh, my work is rooted in, in, in this. Um, I live two miles from um, a former coal strip mine and it recently closed about three years ago or two years ago. I don't know, it's gone by so fast. Um, and similar to a lot of the conversation um, here that, um, you know, coming and living from a coal impacted community, I think it's really shaped my understanding of energy in general, um, but also just what it takes to be able to look towards um, diversification of economy um, to rural communities where we all, you know, many of us come from and on reservations. Um, yeah, there's a lot that goes into um, thinking about when you're talking about just transition or energy transition. And um, Andrew and I have, you know, um, discussed a lot in, in, for many years, just, you know, with Navajo Nation being similar, like Crow Tribe, um, you know, the, the major revenues come from coal. And so, um, I understand that it's it's um, been really hard for Navajo Nation right now since they have lost um, or there's been a coal plant and coal mine that has recently closed. Anyways, um, just would love this discussion because it is something that I've um, spent a lot of time on and, and I'll share what we're working on right now. Um, if you don't know our office, we um, were established about 10 years ago and this is our statute. Um, one is to promote Indian tribal energy development um, and efficiency in use. Uh, two is to reduce and stabilize energy costs. Three, enhance and strengthen Indian tribal energy and economic infrastructure. And then four is bring electrical power and service to Indian land and homes. Um, we have been um, working very hard. We have an amazing team, small team, but mighty, and we're continuing to grow, but we um, definitely have a lot of leaders that have helped shape this office within Department of Energy and um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, in the past 10 years, we've uh, uh, invested 120 million to uh, close to 210 um, tribal energy projects um, in Alaska and the, they call it lower 48 too. Um, and it's been really exciting to see the momentum in Indian country and um, through tribal communities, tribal nations, um, Alaska native villages, uh, rural remote communities that have been doing this um, kind of seeding projects, mostly clean energy projects in their communities for a very long time. So it's not just recently, I know there's a huge clean energy movement now, um, but tribes have been doing this based on um, preparing uh, for climate, um, you know, in case there's a climate disaster uh, with uh, forest fires or flooding, um, so, you know, many of these projects are to create backup power and also create reliable power for communities that are so remote and rural. 
And, and that's what I love about um, many of these projects. And they're also energy efficiency projects. Um, and there's a lot, I mean, you can learn more, it's on our website. And um, the, the cool thing about you know, this administration in, um, in supporting our work, we have an increase um, in our budget last year. So um, our annual budget would range between seven to 22 million annually. And um, just last year, we got 58 million. So this is huge for our office that we can be able to continue to invest in these projects that tribes have and that are submitting um, to our, our funding opportunities. We have a deployment program that where we offer financial assistance and we also offer technical assistance at no cost to tribes and we do education and capacity building. So we hold monthly webinars and, um, and through technical assistance, um, we also provide, um, you know, it could be strategic energy planning, it could be um, visioning, um, or, you know, depending on where the tribe is at and thinking about a project or, um, you know, we, we sort of help them navigate that and where we can help assist. Um, our, all of our financial assistance has invested and 46 megawatts of new generation installed. And on the right, you could see some of the projects here, um, housing, solar, uh, battery storage, wind. And um, so you can see these numbers, it's really great savings for um, a lot of the tribes that do apply over time. And we, we love that. And I think that's something that um, is definitely uh, proven that you know clean energy in general, if you combine solar and battery storage, can save a lot in the long term. Um, going back to technical assistance, we offer technical analysis um, and financial analysis, and again, strategic energy planning. Um, so if you know of a tribe or if you are a tribal leader, um, please look into this because I think this is an area that is really important and most people don't know that we um, offer it at no cost. Um, we've completed, uh, gosh, over, I mean, tons of requests for technical assistance. And I think that, um, I think it's close to 450 technical assistance requests that we've completed. And, um, you know, it's, it's nice to the diversity that we get of, of these requests throughout Indian country. Um, here are some examples of some of the projects we've supported. Ute Mountain Ute, um, we did one, uh, supported a one megawatt solar system and you see the Bethel Wind construction project and um, recently saw this one in, uh, at, at, in Alaska. And then the Aleut um, Community Store Deep Energy Retrofit. So those are some quick examples and um, go to our website. It's awesome. We have a tribal energy database um, that you, where you can see if you're looking at um, certain type of projects, um, there's different filters in there and you can see what, you know, different uh, if you have different resources and where you're at. Um, we have a, also just a, a lot of information um, on our website. And then we, we also do, again, these uh, monthly webinars where we've been getting a lot of good uh, participation from um, tribes based on, uh, right now we're doing kind of a series on funding opportunities through DOE. And so we'll bring in other, um, programs that are offering um, or have funding opportunities to join our webinar and share more with tribal leaders. Um, we also do a lot of listening sessions. We held um, one on energy access, uh, energy reliability uh, last year, and also one on financing and the challenges and the barriers. Um, and soon we'll be announcing one that's gonna be focused on tribal power preference. And this is one area that we're trying to strengthen for Indian country where, you know, federal agencies can um, prioritizing, prioritize um, purchasing clean power from tribes or clean energy project, or products. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter and we'll be able to uh, update you on what, what's coming out as far as funding opportunities and different events. Um, what I wanted to get to, and I'm sorry I had to rush through those slides, is our memorandum of understanding between Navajo Nation and Department of Energy and Department of Interior and other federal agencies. This is an initiative that um, was sparked due to the, um, uh, the interagency working group on coal um, communities. This is a nationwide effort. Uh, we've had, it's an interagency effort. Um, 
where President Biden um, directed a lot of the agencies to look at um, supporting and figuring out how to um, re, uh, identify all the resources within uh, federal agencies that could support coal impacted communities. So as you know, Navajo Nation, the Crow Tribe, the Hopi Tribe, um, they have been seeing the impacts of um, decline of coal on the market, um, but also the closure of coal plants and coal mines. And so we um, sparked this memorandum of understanding with Navajo Nation uh, last fall and uh, was signed December 1st, I believe. And since then, since December 1st, we've been working towards an implement implementation plan um, that we will be wrapping up, I think, at the end of May. And this um, implementation plan is going to help direct all of us who are participating on identifying the projects and the interests that Navajo Nation has on economic diversification and their interests, whether it's a local, you know, projects to, you know, could be utility scale projects. And these are the areas that we're identifying right now and um, connecting them to the agencies that might have some funding opportunities, um, you know, uh, announced or uh, on coming up. Um, and so we're having a work session next week. And, um, but this is, I can share this slide deck, but the purpose of the MOU is really to um, help us build a framework on collaboration between federal agencies and um, the, the tribes. And so we're looking at strategic energy planning, um, capacity building, um, just really the collaboration. Um, and uh, I wanna say that we also are being uh, facilitated by, and which is an amazing group called Indigenous Collaborations. And um, Leslie um, Cabote and Paul Cabote have been really great at um, convening these sessions. And so we're um, working with them. And so they've been facilitating but the idea is to get everyone that has, um, you know, uh, that are from the community, that are tribal leaders, um, uh, legislative, um, executive, and judicial leaders that are, we're all in the same room planning this. And so it's um, pretty historic. I think uh, being Navajo <laughs> is that we're able to get everyone in the same room and work towards, um, you know, we're, we're working fast because we know from, for this administration, we, you know, we were like what less than two years that we have. And so we want to make sure that we're helping to support um, the Navajo Nation in this process. So um, yeah, so these are the some of the agencies that are also involved, um, which is USDA, um, Commerce, and EPA, Department of Transportation, Interior, and DOE. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be more agencies coming to the table to help support. So we held a meeting in um, on March 9th, and that's what kicked off this um, energy transition planning process. Um, and we held a, a meeting last a couple of weeks ago, and and then we're going to have one next week. So we're on a fast um, timeline. And again, please reach out. Uh, this is our website and all of our information. And um, really appreciate the time you all have given me. Thank you, um, Orhela. Um, we're so lucky to have you in DC and um, the great work you're doing in this administration. So thank you. Um, we're gonna, amazingly, we're kind of on time. So <laughs> we are gonna move into our Q and A um, session. And just to kind of remind folks again, the Q and A button on the Zoom on the bottom, you can click on that if you have a question and please signify um, whether it's a general or directed towards a panelist. And then I'll kind of go through pick some out and ask them to the, the panel. Um, all speakers, please turn on your cameras and unmute. Um, and then we can um, mute as needed if you're not speaking. And each speaker's video window will be visible. And hopefully all of you guys can see it out there. And so I'll begin the Q&A. We've got a bunch of questions already. So um, I know everyone's excited to get into it. So I'll kind of take it from the top. And um, these will, if they're posed to an individual, I'll, 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 I'll let you guys know. But the first one we have is, um, how are you thinking about including community views while respecting sovereignty as embodied in elected tribal council? It's a great question. Um, do any of the panelists want to take that on? I mean, maybe Andrew and Monica in particular, I think your project really has a lot of this piece active in it. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that since uh, I'm uh, doing the engagement piece. Um, well, like we were saying in our presentation, every community is different and we have uh, different institutions within the tribal government. 
uh, that oversee um, human subjects research. And so um, depends on who you're working with and how they set things up. They might have a historic preservation office or they might have um, something that they want to go formally through council or not, uh, if they have a council system. So um, all of that is to say that um, we work with the institutions uh, of the community and um, in order to get the, the appropriate kind of um, uh, research um, um, uh, endorsement from, from, that, from that institution and for that set of institutions. Because, you, and this goes to the legacy of research in these communities, which we kind of spoke about, like so many researchers have come into these places and done things misleadingly. And I think that's what communities are, are, um, are trying to prevent. You know, they want clear, honest, transparent uh, research to know where we're coming from, what our, what our questions are, what, who we're going to talk to and how we're going to, we're going to do that kind of research. And that's not to say that we're going to disclose everyone's identity. We work with um, with those uh, institutions that uphold standards of research, which re requires, in some cases, confidentiality. You know, of whom who of participants, or even if you're doing like some sort of surveying, uh, anonymity. I can't ever say that word correctly. But you know, they we're, we work with the tribal institutions on how we interact with the community members because at the end of the day they're interested in protecting their their membership and uh, protecting them from outside institutions including our research organizations where we're coming from like at the university or other level so we're mindful of that we're mindful of the legacy of research in these places and also want to um you know be be uh, respectful of the, the the processes that the tribal governments have set up thank you um julia did you have something to add to Sure, I'll just mention that we're really lucky to have a tribal college which has a really um, robust IRB and also archives um, that will be the data repository um, under a data sovereignty agreement that is written according to um, existing legislat le legislation from the Crow tribal government. Um, it's not explicitly dependent on a current partnership with the Crow tribal government. Um, that government not all, but the leadership of that government is really forward facing on continuing coal development. So it makes these conversations quite tricky. Um, but we can we can observe the rules set by the tribal sovereign government, as well as the IRB process administered through the college and the college plays this really nice kind of um, buffering role as a place to hold knowledge for the future and will be the long-term data repository for all of the data generated through this project. I don't I don't want to say anything that I don't want to foreclose Dory and Jordan adding to this because I know they think a lot about these questions. Okay, if no one has um, any other comments on that, we can move to our next question. Um, this one's directed for um, Wahela. And it's, um, what is the biggest research need you have and how can the academic community help you? Clearly, this is from an academic. <laughs> awesome. Um, yes, we need actually um, support. Um, it would be amazing if we had support in helping to identify unelectrified homes in Indian country. Um, this is a huge task. We actually held two listening sessions, um, as I mentioned, and um, you know, we probably didn't get everyone's input. And I think there's a layer of like, you have, you know, sort of this, um, what studies have been done out there on the federal level. And then also what we hear from listening sessions, but it's the local level that, you know, getting down to like the chapter and the community that have, I bet those numbers, but it's going to take organizing and somebody helping to like do those visits. And um, yeah, so we are coming out with a congressional report on um, uh, that that's focused on um, the unelectrified homes and then also um, uh, unreliable power. So, yeah, and I and I hope this could help you know bridge the the need of um, we just need more more um, uh, numbers and um, yeah. So that's one area. Um, the other is, um, I mean, I love the conversation. I think there's something to chat around right now where, um, you know, as we are moving through this clean energy revolution, um, we have over $100 billion we have to get out from DOE. 
And many of this is going to make sure that we're, um, you know, uh, supporting America made products. And this goes to, you know, if we're talking about EV, you know, where are we going to mine from? And, you know, where are we going to get the supply chain and critical minerals comes in? And all of this is, I think, a, a larger uh, dialogue that Indian country is still trying to, like, as someone mentioned, is we're, you know, many times we're in survival mode. And so, and can't think about, you know, kind of, um, you know, what's going on at the national level and how can we participate as Indian country. And so our role is really to start to have uh, convene these conversations and be able to make sure that, you know, um, we get the people and the parties at the table. Um, I mean, this is one, this is what our statute's all about is making, you know, our constituent bases, 574 federally recognized tribes. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to, to um, take on and, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're in, we, we hear everybody, but we also need support um, in, in that research too. Thank you. I mean, actually, I think one of these questions um, that appear in the q and I think raises some of the issues that you raised with Kahala, which is like, um, and I'll just read the question. Does, I, I think it has to do with um, now with all the money going into this transition, um, the question is, does anyone on this panel look at how transition policy is currently increasing mining projects that are polluting tribal lands and destroying sacred sites? So how the transition itself might be fueling other forms of environmental justice? I'm, I'm happy to um, talk to that. I mean, I, I think um, for our office, you know, we're really focused on kind of small um, scale, commercial scale projects. And um, yeah, I think when you're talking more like the gigawatts and megawatts, um, but also the supply chain, you know, those those are the areas that, um, you know, DOE is definitely, you know, um, hearing the concerns from tribes, hearing the concerns of even just um, where projects are sort of adjacent to um, another kind of maybe area that is um, gonna be looked towards um, developing their natural resources um, and that they're downwind. And we have that, you know, we know this history in Indian country. And um, I think the pieces that we would like to continue to facilitate is this larger dialogue around kind of the national build out and planning process that includes and respects um, you know, tribe, tribal sovereignty and their treaties and our trust responsibility. That's the four, that's the, that's the main thing. Like um, this administration has really um, pushed all of our agencies to do better um, in engaging with tribes in um, making sure that we are, um, you know, letting them know ahead of time and they're included in these conversations and no decisions, you know, are being made without, you know, this, this process. Um, and I think that, that, you know, we're all uh, wanting to figure that out, um, but I, you know, there's going to be some good, tough conversations that need to be had. Um, Bindu, did you have something to add? I have a hand up. Um, sure. So in some of the conversations that I've had, uh, the battery issue has come up uh, very much in the meetings, especially community members are really concerned about you know, in uh, newer batteries um, that uh, are being implemented in almost all of the communities. In some of the communities, they've had trouble uh, working the battery. So technical issues have been a, a major issue. Uh, but also at the borough level, they are looking into getting like cobalt free batteries. So that is something that they're doing. But the uh, Northwest Arctic Borough also uh, hosts the Red Dog Mine, which is the largest, uh, you know, lead sink um, uh, a, a mine um, in the world. And uh, they are, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, their life is, the end of the life is about in, in about seven or eight years. And they're thinking about, uh, what to do after the mine closes, uh, what options are there. Um, so it is actually a very crucial uh, time uh, for the region because a lot of the revenue for the borough comes from the mine itself. 
and also 50% of the revenue for the NANA Corporation comes from the mine itself. So these are really important issues that the, uh, the, the region itself and the NANA Corporation, which is the NANSCA Corporation, are, are really heavily um, dealing with. Um, uh, you know, there are talks about, you know, a potential copper mine and, you know, in the region and the state is uh, interested in building a road uh, to the Ambler mine. Um, so um, there is a lot of conversation on what is going to happen next, especially with the Red Dog mine and also the Ambler mine in the Northwest Arctic. Thank you. So uh, we have a question for um, Jordan and Jory. And I'll try to shorten it, but I'll read the question. <laughs> Thank you for emphasizing the needs that come before the solutions that so many fail to consider. My question is, how has trust and relationships been initiated for these collaborations? Um, what did those very first conversation invitations consent requests look like? Just as Andrew spoke about extractive history of academia and these types of conversations, I find the trust repair to be the hardest to navigate, even without my own tribe. So I'm um, Jory and Jordan, or either. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you for that question. Um, this is definitely something that I don't take lightly, especially uh, living on the reservation. Um, and so I think Julia and her team um, has done a very great job of creating those community partnerships and working with our tribal college I think um, the way that this cohort was set up was very strategic. Um, we have the advisory committee who consists of Upsalaga knowledge holders and community leaders who understand that this energy justice is needed and these conversations need to be had. And also people who are willing to educate um, the younger generation. And so our cohort of the emerging leaders are also like-minded, educated people who are doing work on the ground in our community. and. I feel like when you bring together um, people who are are working for the same thing, um, for the same cause, um, it does a, a great deed. And um, Julia's team has been very, very upfront about, um, you know, why they're here doing this work and um, wanting to partner with us, but also um, making sure that they're not doing the extractive um, activities that um, research has has done for a very long time within indigenous communities. Um, they really put our ideas at the forefront, um, make sure that our, our questions are always being answered, especially when it comes to that uh, coal history, um, learning that foundation, um, it's been really, it's been a learning curve for sure. I'd have to say that I'm very grateful for this cohort and the group who who um, is working for the same thing. And um, it, it's up to us to go back into our families, to start in the home and to radiate that information. I think starting from that, uh, I, I I don't like the word top down approach or bottom up approach. Um, I, I but I mean, to think of it in an academic context, um, I'll use that, but to start from the ground up, starting within our families, it'll it, it'll radiate out, out of our home into our communities and then into our nation. And so I think um, we're trying very hard to ensure that our needs are always um, at the forefront and ensuring that we, we can make this just transition, we can have these difficult conversations and it's up to us to do the work on the ground as well. Um, Jordan, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, thanks, Jordan. That um, kind of summed it up really nice. The only thing I'll add is just that, you know, on the note of of Julia and her team centering our our voices and our questions and the the lived experiences that all of us bring to these conversations, that that has been like tremendous. It, you know, the thing that I really appreciate from Julia and her team is, is the layering of, you know, there is the leadership cohort with those of us, you know, younger generation and, and having these conversations and learning these things and bringing these new ideas to the table. And then like the, the next level of that or layer of that is, is the advisory cohort who are not advisory advisors from universities around the country or like top 
top scientists or researchers in energy, you know, like they're from our community. They're people who were present when some of these decisions were being made. And so they they help fill in that that knowledge gap between those of us that don't know and and them that do. And then we have, you know, Julia and her team acting. You know, I feel like Julia has said this in several of our meetings that they she wants, you know, to position herself and the, their team as as resources for whatever we need. And and I appreciate that. And I also appreciate the guidance that they kind of give to to help push us along. But the the key thing here for me is that it's when I when I first joined the cohort and when I first walked into the room, I wasn't walking into a room of researchers and, and academics. I was walking into a room with people from my community that I knew. I have relatives that are in that space with me. I have, you know, like elders or knowledge holders that have helped, have seen me grow up and things like that. And that has made such a difference in how this conversation is unfolding. And and I think so when it speaking to that trust that building of that trust is, you know, it's it's filling the room with as many people from the community as possible with, like Jory said, that common interest in in or that common goal to to drive this transition forward and and all working to collaboratively to to see that through. Um, yeah. I might just add, I know we have short time. The, the possibility for me to partner originally to think about this proposal is predicated on 20 years of trust building work between the tribal college, the environmental health steering committee, and my colleagues at MSU. And I do want to like credit my university for really being a leader in community-based participatory research, particularly around health. So this couldn't happen without that 20 year history. So I want to like give space for all the projects that are just starting to maybe not have this level of engagement, but also to call out the funders that, you know, three years um, is not nearly enough time to support projects like this having meaningful outcomes. So we're very grateful for it. We have to really be careful about what we're promising when we're starting these kinds of initiatives and what kind of long-term commitment we're ready to make to these communities. Unfortunately, we've reached the end of the time for this webinar. Um, I think this is actually a really good place to stop because it kind of gets back to how the research starts and what are the important parts and how um, you know the communities really have to be a part of it from the beginning. And thank you, everyone, for your presentations. Um, we could talk all day, and I would love to. Um, but all, th all great things must end. And um, I want to especially say um, thank you to all the attendees as well as well as Anna Krasati, who is a policy integrity, who organized the webinar and organized all of you to be a part of this. So um, thank you to Anna for, for doing that. And um, yeah, this, we will uh, make some of these available. The, we'll try to get the presentations from folks. And if um, some of the attendees want to um, have a chance to get them, we'll follow back up. Um, I want to note that uh, we have another webinar coming on May 15th on energy insecurity and energy transitions, obstacles and opportunities. You can go to the policy integrity site to register for it. Um, and But until then, thank you for attending and um, thank you for sharing all the great work you're doing and um, in, in academia as well as in DC and on the ground. So uh, thank you everyone for attending and um, hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. So we're Thank going to get you. coffee after this, right?